Mary Ann Nichols, the woman brutally murdered on Box Row off the Whitechapel Road, was buried on Thursday the 6th of September from Henry Smith's Undertakers, 87 Hanbury Street in Spitalfields. This latest atrocity in the neighbourhood was the talk of Whitechapel. Already the police and the newspaper men were linking the murder in George Yard to the slaughter of Polly Nichols, and everywhere there was a growing sense of terror that there was a homicidal maniac on the loose in the slums of East London. It would be a long time yet before anyone used the term serial killer, and it would not be until the end of the present month until anyone used the chilling moniker Jack the Ripper. On the evening of the funeral, the Star newspaper, reporting from a common lodging house on Thrall Street, described how women would come to the house at night in a fainting condition after being knocked about by a leather apron, the name then assumed to be that of the killer, and how the proprietor himself would not venture out after dark. In some respects, the funeral of Mary Ann Nichols was the calm before the storm, the opening chapter to what would soon be dubbed the Autumn of Terror. No one could have known that the very next night, the night after Polly's funeral, the killer would be on the prowl again, and he would strike not 200 yards from the undertakers from where Polly had been removed to the cemetery. John Davis had only recently rented the front room on the third floor of 29 Hanbury Street, the top of the house, from Mrs Richardson, the occupier owner. As he reported at the inquest, he and his wife and their three sons had only been living there for about two weeks. On the morning of the 8th of September, 1888, he was awoken by the bells of Christchurch Spitalfields nearby at 5.45 in the morning. He had not slept very well, but he had not heard any disturbance through the night. Getting up out of bed, he had a cup of tea before dressing and making his way to work. He was a carman in the employment of the Leadenhall Market. Before setting out for work, he made his way to the ground floor, intending to use the outdoor toilet in the yard. Coming off the bottom of the stairs, he found the front door wide to the wall. This was not at all unusual, he said. He had never, in fact, seen either the front door or the door at the end of the passage leading into the backyard locked. They did not have locks, and anyone who knew where the latch was could open the door freely from the street and go through into the rear yard. At the back of the building, there was a reasonably sized yard, fenced off from its neighbours on either side with a fence of about 5 foot 6 inches in height, high enough for most people not to be able to see over. At the bottom, to the left, facing out into the yard, there was a small wooden shed where Mrs Richardson stored her wood for her packing case business, and to the right of this there was a red brick outhouse, the shared convenience of everyone living at the address. The door to the yard opened outwards and swung to the left, towards the fence dividing the backyards of number 27 and 29. From the house to the yard, there was a set of three stone steps without banister or railing, and it was from the top step, as he was making his way out of the door, that Mr Davis saw the body of a dead woman lying beside the fence. Finding a dead body would have been shocking enough for anyone, but the sight that met John Davis at six o'clock that morning was one of abject horror. This was a body a murderous madman had toyed with. Her butcher, as it is the work of a butcher that the scene describes, had opened her up and taken the time to pull out various parts of her innards and place them about her. Her murderer clearly took an immense and sick pleasure in posing his victim in such a manner as to have a maximum impact on anyone who saw his handiwork. We see the effectiveness of this in Mr Davis's account, that he had been too much upset to remember whether or not the back door was latched. Mr Davis was positively traumatised by the state the dead woman was in. 
Before fully grasping the horror of the scene, John Davis turned on his heels and fled the house in search of a policeman. Just outside the front door, however, he saw James Green and James Kent, two men he recognised by sight from Bailey's packing case makers three doors down from number 29. He told them to come and see the woman, and they did. Without entering the yard, all three men left the scene together, and John ran the almost 370 yards to Commercial Street Police Station. Another man, Henry Holland, did go out into the yard, but he did not touch the woman. Kent was stunned by what he saw. Unable to find a constable, he poured himself a brandy and pottered about in search of a piece of canvas or hessian with which to cover the woman. By the time he returned, the police had already taken over the scene. Inspector Joseph Chandler was on duty at Commercial Street Station when all of a sudden a number of men came running, one man shouting, another woman has been murdered. Immediately, the inspector followed the man back to 29 Hanbury Street and passed through the house to the backyard, which was empty now save for the body of the deceased woman. He saw the body of a woman lying on the ground on her back, her head was towards the back wall of the house, nearly two feet from the wall at the bottom of the steps, but six or nine inches away from them. The face was turned to the right, and the left arm was resting on the left breast. The right hand was lying down the right side. The deceased's legs were drawn up, and the clothing was above the knees. A portion of the intestine, still connected with the body, were lying above the right shoulder, with some pieces of skin. There were also some pieces of skin on the left shoulder. The body was lying parallel with the fencing dividing the two yards. He remained there and sent for the divisional surgeon Mr Phillips and to the police station for the ambulance and for further assistance. After the body had been removed, Chandler found a piece of muslin, a small comb and a hair comb in a case lying where the woman's feet had been. Close to where her head had been, there was a small piece of paper torn from an envelope containing two pills. It would take a considerable amount of pressure from the coroner, Win Edwin Baxter, to compel the police surgeon, Dr George Baxter Phillips, an experienced surgeon and a member of the Royal College, to read the details of his post-mortem into the public record. During his first deposition, describing the scene, he said he had arrived at 29 Hanbury Street at half past six, ten minutes after being called to the scene. There he found the woman lying to the left side of the steps going out, between the stone steps and the fence. Her head was not six inches from the bottom step and her feet were towards the shed at the bottom of the yard, her body being parallel to the fence. Her legs were raised, parted at the knee, exposing the sex organs and her feet close together and flat on the ground. Her lower intestines had been removed from the body cavity and set to the right side of the body above the shoulder and part of the stomach at the left shoulder. Her neck had been cut around the neck in a jagged fashion and this incision was very deep. Her tongue protruding caught between her teeth and very much swollen. The doctor commented on the large quantity of blood around the body and the blood splattering as high as 18 inches on the fence beside the head and the marks of blood that were found on the house wall between the fence and the steps. He saw the items at the woman's feet, the piece of muslin, the two combs, and commented that they appeared to have been arranged there, presumably by her killer. When asked about the time of death, Dr Phillips averred at least two hours and probably more, putting the time of death to about 4.30 or before. He was aware that it being a cold morning, the body, having lost so much blood, would have cooled more rapidly. Ultimately, the coroner would reject the expert opinion of Dr Phillips in favour of evidence presented by three other witnesses, Mrs Long, 
Albert Kadosh and John Richardson, placing her death to about 5.20 to 5.30 at sunrise. This would suggest the murder and post-mortem mutilation happened in the full light of pre-dawn with perfect visibility. The police, however, never accepted this time of death, describing it in internal memoranda as coming from doubtful evidence. Towards the end of his deposition, on the third day of the inquest, on the 13th of September, Dr Phillips stated that there were various other mutilations to the body, but then he paused. Is it necessary that I describe the further mutilations? When pressed for the details, he answered the coroner somewhat more sharply. You don't wish for the details. After some courtroom haggling, it was agreed that the doctor would return with these details in the event someone was charged with the crime. This notwithstanding, he was recalled the following day with the coroner saying to him, Whatever may be your opinion and objections, it appears to me necessary that all the evidence that you ascertained from the post-mortem examination should be on the records of the court for various reasons, which I need not enumerate. However painful it may be, it is necessary in the interests of justice. So shocking was this testimony given by the doctor to the sensibilities of the time that even the most sensationalist of the newspapers at the time decided against publishing the full details. But we do get a hint of its contents from an article published in the medical journal The Lancet on the 29th of September. The mutilation of the body was of such a character as could only have been affected by a practised hand. It was apparent that the abdomen had been entirely laid open, that the intestines severed from their attachments had been lifted out of the body and placed on the shoulder of the corpse. Whilst from the pelvis, the uterus and its appendages, with the upper portion of the vagina and the posterior two-thirds of the bladder, had been entirely removed, no trace of these parts could be found, and the incisions were cleanly cut, avoiding the rectum and dividing the vagina low enough to avoid injury to the cervix uteri. Obviously, the work was that of an expert, of one at least, who had such knowledge of anatomical or pathological examinations as to be enabled to secure the pelvic organs with one sweep of a knife, which must therefore, as Mr Phillips pointed out, have been at least five inches long. The victim had been strangled, likely with her own handkerchief, before her attacker lowered her to the ground, gripping her jaw and cutting her neck all the way around and so deeply that the blade hit bone. From the details of the further post-mortem attack, we get an unsettling insight into the psychology of her murderer. His object was not, strangely, the murder itself, rather the mutilation was his motive. In his deranged curiosity to expose and play with the visceral interior of the female anatomy, the Ripper was engaged in what modern profilers would describe as spectacle and performance, and this explains the grotesque theatre he leaves behind. It was somehow important to him that those who discovered his victims experienced the full show of what gave him so much pleasure and drove him to take such risks. Baxter Phillips and the author of the article in The Lancet concurred with their considerable medical expertise that the perverse procedure would have been the work of at least half an hour, which is also our strongest indication the assault on Polly Nichols had been interrupted. News of the murder, even as it was being reported to Inspector Chandler at Commercial Street, raced over Whitechapel and Spitalfields with the force of a tsunami, and for the second time in almost as many days, Hanbury Street was packed with people coming to see the scene of the crime. Much is said today 
about the odd behaviour of the Victorian murder tourists, people paying a few pennies to look down on the yard where the body was found from neighbouring windows. But not much has changed. Isn't this just what we are doing now? We are a curious species when it comes to the macabre. We too have an odd infatuation with the spectacle and performance of murder. But let us stick a pin in that one for the time being. Inspector Frederick George Aberline, a detective well acquainted with Whitechapel, had been recalled from his recent posting to Great Scotland Yard to assist J Division in the investigation into the murder on Box Row. H Division needed him now too, and Acting Superintendent West penned a missive on the day of the murder requesting Aberline's assistance. But what he did not know, however, was that Inspector Aberline had already been informed of the murder on Hanbury Street, and had been put on the case. As a consequence of the lightning speed with which the news of the murder spread, and the police's inquiries at common lodging houses and through the poorer houses of the district, the body of the woman was quickly identified as that of Annie Chapman, a 47-year-old woman currently residing at 35 Dorset Street. On the morning after the murder, on the 9th of September, once a post-mortem examination had taken place, Mr Fontaine Smith, her younger brother, and Mr Timothy Donovan, the keeper of the lodging house at No. 35 Dorset Street, Crossingham's lodging house, positively identified her in the Whitechapel workhouse mortuary as the Annie they knew. What would emerge from the accounts of these two men was a surprising picture of the trajectory of her life, one that showed that social mobility, downward social mobility, was a reality in late Victorian London. Her brother Fontaine explained at the inquest on the Whitechapel Road that Annie had been married to a coachman by the name of John Chapman and had been living a respectable life in Windsor. Respectable is invariably a Victorian social code for employed working class or middle class more generally. He had met her last quite casually and had given her a couple of shillings for her lodgings. Unlike her holier-than-thou sisters, her little brother comes across as a decent man. But maybe I am being too harsh on her sisters. Annie had struggled with the demon drink since she was very young, no doubt struggling to come to terms with her own father's suicide, but she gained some stability in marriage, and she and John Chapman had three children, Emily Ruth, Annie Georgina, and John Alfred. Yet it was in this seemingly picture-perfect ideal of Victorian domestic life that the triggers of her downward chaotic spiral lay. Their son was born disabled, and although the family had sought help in a London hospital, they were forced in the end to place him in an institution. John and Annie occasionally visited their son, but the strain began to take its toll on Annie, pulling her back into the vortex of drink. In November 1882, the year after they had relocated to Windsor, their eldest, Emily Ruth, succumbed to meningitis and died and soon both John and Annie were drinking heavily. Her drunkenness and the public embarrassment it caused John's employer eventually came to a head, and the couple came to the decision to part ways. While John remained on the estate with their remaining daughter, Annie returned to London where she lived on an allowance of ten shillings, enough to keep the wolf from the door. But disaster struck on Christmas Day 1886, when John Chapman died of cirrhosis of the liver and the weekly post office orders stopped. Without support or an income of her own, Annie Chapman quickly sank into the depths of addiction and poverty in the East End of London. At the time of her murder, Annie was not a well woman. She had been to the infirmary and found it difficult to keep going but she could not have a bed unless she could come up with the money. In the end, this want of a mere eight pennies drove her out into the streets to find a customer who would pay her for sex. 
She had begged the keeper to allow her to stay a while in the kitchen, and he saw the awful and wretched state of health she was in. In fact, it was discovered at her post-mortem that she was terminally ill. The disease of her lungs and brains would have killed her within a few months. She had been paying for a room there for the previous five months, but she was at the very bottom now, and no credit would be extended to her. Never mind, Tim, she said on leaving the house. I shall soon be back. Don't let the bed. This was about ten minutes to two in the morning. She left the house in the direction of Brushfield Street, and Donovan never saw her alive again. Not to worry. There were plenty of other disposable, impoverished and vulnerable women to pay for a night's doss in his kip. Shortly after two o'clock in the morning of the 8th of September, Annie Chapman, a seriously sick and dying woman, left Crossingham's lodging house on Dorset Street in search of a customer. She did not make it back to her lodgings with money for the room. Instead, she fell into the hands of a deeply disturbed, murderous psychopath and was discovered dead and horribly mutilated soon after sunrise. Annie Chapman was a victim. She was not only the victim of the man who killed her, but a victim of a society that provided her with no safety net and no protection, and a society which blamed her for her own victimhood. May you rest in peace, Annie. Good night, and God bless.